Welcome to FYI, the four-year innovation podcast. This show offers an intellectual discussion on technologically enabled disruption, because investing in innovation starts with understanding it. To learn more, visit arc-invest.com. Arc Invest is a registered investment advisor focused on investing in disruptive innovation. This podcast is for informational purposes only and should not be relied upon as a basis for investment decisions. It does not constitute either explicitly or implicitly any provision of services or products by ARC. All statements made regarding companies or securities are strictly beliefs and points of view held by ARC or podcast guests and are not endorsements or recommendations by ARC to buy, sell, or hold any security. Clients of ARC Investment Management may maintain positions in the securities discussed in this podcast. Welcome to ARC's For Your Innovation podcast. Today, we're joined by Kathy Hanoon, the president and co-founder of Dandelion Energy. Thanks for joining us today, Kathy. Thank you for having me. So, you know, the first thing is Dandelion Energy. What type of energy are we talking about today? We are talking about geothermal energy and specifically thermal energy. So heat energy from the very shallow underground. We're talking the very surface layer. So what we do is we install heat pumps for heating and cooling homes. So I think just for a broader audience, what is geothermal heating? How does it even work? Where do these pipes go? And you know, how does it both heat and cool? I feel like this is obviously very, very basic, but important to set the ground. Definitely. And actually not so basic. I feel like this is a great question. So it turns out that there's a lot of heat in the environment all around us, even in the depths of winter when it's super cold out. But there's a lot more heat right when you go underground than there is in the air outside. So, you know, when you get, let's say, eight feet below ground and below, you start to get to temperatures around 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So clearly not the temperature you want your home to be at, but a lot warmer than the zero degrees Fahrenheit it might be in the outside air. So what we do is we put these simple plastic pipes underground and they circulate water. And that water essentially just becomes the temperature of the ground. It absorbs heat from the ground. We then pump that water into a heat pump that's sitting in the basement, typically where the furnace used to be. And that heat pump is designed to extract the heat from the water and then boost the temperature so that it can distribute air that's around 100 degrees Fahrenheit throughout your home to warm it. And then the entire system runs in reverse in the summer. So the heat pump will actually absorb heat from your house, thereby cooling it, and then put that heat in the water. And as that water circulates underground, it cools because that ground is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's a very, very efficient way to air condition your home in the summer. So the same system is able to do both. Again, this is, uh, I feel like asking asking the dumb question that is on uh, many people's minds, but people might be afraid to ask it. How do you go from the 55 degrees of the water to the 100 degree air temperature? How do you actually moderate and raise that up and lower it down? Absolutely. This is precisely what heat pumps are really good at. And they do it using refrigerants. So you can have that refrigerant exchange heat with the water. So the refrigerant, let's say, becomes that 50 degree Fahrenheit temperature. And then you run that refrigerant through a compressor. And as that compressor compresses the refrigerant, it boosts the temperature. Because I don't know if you remember this from like high school physics, but PV equals NRT. So by compressing the the refrigerant or boosting the temperature. And that's a great way of actually harvesting that 50 degree heat to produce much hotter heat that's more useful for your home. Awesome. So now that now that everyone's a, a semi-pro at geothermal, what about dandelion energy? How did you come to be involved with geothermal? What brought you into this space? I was originally a product manager at X, um, formerly known as Google X. And my job was scouting essentially for technologies that we might be able to use to do something useful at scale in energy. And to be honest, I really didn't know that much about heat pumps. I mean, it's like I grew up in New Hampshire. I used fuel oil. So in fact, I in some ways 
kind of my family was our target customer, but I had never heard of using geothermal for heating. And it was only when a fellow Googler told me about this opportunity that I really started to learn about it. And, you know, the technology has been around for decades. It's widely used in Sweden. So it's actually not breakthrough. It's been around. It's just in this country, no one's ever found a way to scale it and make it affordable. And the more I learned about why that was, or like the types of obstacles holding this technology back, the more convinced I became that they seemed very overcomable. And if we could do it, I mean, this is actually a renewable way to heat and cool buildings. And buildings are responsible for about 20% of US greenhouse gas emissions. So it's a huge problem. This seemed like a potentially very good way to solve it. Exactly to what you were saying. So what has changed? Why now for the US? What's made it possible to scale? There are a number of things. I think there's like business factors and then technology and product factors. But to start with the business side of things, I mean, one big change from the 90s, let's say, till today, if you just look at the price of heating fuels, they used to be sort of reliably low. And now they're extremely volatile and much, much higher than they've ever been. I mean, and recent events have pushed that higher still, right? And so I think the increased cost of how we do heating with fossil fuels, plus an increased awareness, honestly, from homeowners that they would prefer to do it renewably has led to much more, I think, customer reception around switching off of something like fuel oil, propane, or natural gas. In addition, the solar industry and how that industry scaled, rooftop solar in particular, it built a lot of the roadmap that we're following. And what I mean by that is traditionally heat pumps have not been sold with a financing option. So like no one would come to you and say, switch off a fuel fuel oil, get a geothermal heat pump, zero money down and savings from day one. That just like wasn't really done. But the solar industry showed that's a great way to sell home energy products. And we're just borrowing lots of ideas like that and applying them to this use case. So I think the fact that we can look to an industry that has already scaled has been a huge advantage. And then on the technology side, I mean, I think a lot of the challenge with technology innovation in HVAC in general, not specific to geothermal heat pumps, but including geothermal heat pumps, is that distribution of these products to consumers is here's how it works traditionally. So you have a manufacturer who's selling to a distributor, who's selling to a contractor, who's selling to a homeowner. So if you want to innovate and break into that, it's quite difficult. And I think that's that's made it just very hard for any new entrants to, to innovate in this field. And so are you verticalizing kind of through all of those so that you can control control your destiny more completely? Yes, we have had to do that. So, you know, when I first co-founded the company, our plan was to try to work with the existing manufacturers and sort of not vertically integrate. We we really thought naively we could get away with without doing it. And then right away, it was clear that that wasn't going to work. And so, yeah, we had to make the decision and to vertically integrate. And today we have marketing, sales, drillers, installers, the whole thing is under Dandelion. And and that's really given us so much freedom in really prioritizing the uh, innovations that are best for customers and make it easiest to install these systems without having to worry about all of the other stakeholders that we would have had to worry about. Gotcha. And then, you know, you compare it to the solar industry. So I'm wondering, Obviously, you get all of the benefits of the financing and some of the business model there. Do you face similar issues or I feel like the cost of acquiring your customer has always been a challenge for solar. And then, you know, innovation now in the solar industry is how do we analyze the rooftop ahead of time so that we're not paying money and wasting time with people getting up on the roof and seeing if it's actually capable there. Are those issues similar to what Dandelion faces and and how do you kind of go about solving those? I would say that there are three things that come to mind right away that are differences. So let me go, I'll talk about first customer acquisition and then about 
differentiation, I guess, of the product itself, because I think both of those things are meaningful. So on the customer acquisition side, I think there are two factors that are pretty different between geothermal heat pumps and solar. So the first is there's never a moment for a customer deciding to get solar where they would have to get a new electricity system, right? Like you have grid electricity, it works. You don't really have to pay, for, you pay to use it, but you don't have to pay for the upfront capital. So getting solar, it's a very proactive step to buy something you wouldn't otherwise have to get control over your operating cost. Whereas for us, I mean, people go out and buy furnaces and boilers and air conditioners all the time. And that's what we're substituting for. So when we can say, look, we're actually less expensive than going out to buy a furnace and an air conditioner, that homeowner has to make a purchase. And I think that really helps us because we don't have to convince somebody to do something they weren't going to have to do anyway. The second force that I think is pretty different in a meaningful way is how the utilities feel about heat pumps versus how they feel about solar. So they're pretty notorious for being against solar. I think that's fair to say. But we actually, they love heat pumps because when we install a heat pump for a customer, let's say in Westchester, New York, that homeowner is often switching off of something like fuel oil, which is a product the utility is not selling. And then their heat pump runs on electricity. And not only does it run on electricity, but it actually decreases peak demand and leads to a better load factor. So it's very much in the utility's best interest to see homeowners adopt heat pumps. And that's led to huge incentives from utilities. So we get um, our homeowners enjoy incentives anywhere from about $7,000 for their heat pump on the low end to upwards of literally $40,000 in some places. And that's just utilities subsidizing their heat pumps because they want them to get heat pumps. That's super interesting. I hadn't thought about that before. How many kilowatt hours does a typical geothermal heat pump system use over the course of a year? The metric that we use most of the time is just the tonnage of heating capacity that a typical home will need, which is about five tons. So I can do the conversion for you, but we don't typically speak in units of kilowatt hours per year. I was going to mention one more thing just about why we're slightly different than solar. I think the last thing that's worth mentioning is one solar company's panels typically don't differ too much from the customer's perspective from another company's panels. And I do think that this makes customer acquisition cost even more of a challenge because you're competing without a lot of differentiation. We think that there are actually is a lot of room for differentiation in heat pumps because they're not such a commodity. Like they really do have meaningful features, different efficiencies, different compatibilities with different types of homes and different costs. And like, you know, they have a lot of different differences between companies that allow more of a, hopefully more of a path to develop a proprietary product that a competitor couldn't have an exact copy of. And are most of the customers that you're seeing, are they building new homes or are they rip and replace? Most of our customers are rip and replace, but about 20%, I would say, of our customers are building new homes. And we haven't yet, as a business, installed projects, really wide scale new home builds, but we are working towards that. So, for example, one of our investors is Lennar, the home builder. And we're really trying to work with them to see what would it take to install geo in thousands of homes, tens of thousands of homes, so that we're not putting fossil systems into homes and then ripping it out and putting heat pumps in. That's surprising to me because I imagine that with the type of landscaping and things that you'd need to do, it would seem like new home would be the more attractive target. And we've also done a lot of modeling on the solar, right? You solve a lot of the solar issues if you get a home builder to do something like a solar roof. And then all of a sudden, you know, you have solar roof, geothermal heating, and it's a a selling point for the home builder as well. Uh, Lower operating cost for the end customer. Yeah, I think that we'll get there. It is true that it's a lower operating cost for the end user. The challenge that you have is the home builder cares 
a lot about the upfront cost. So even if the upfront cost of a heat pump is slightly more and then you get a dramatically lower operating cost, it's still going to be difficult for a home builder to make that decision because they're trying to build the lowest cost possible home. And so usually the way you solve that type of problem is through financing products, right? So that you can translate that upfront cost into an operating cost. And that's some of what we're working on today. Like, can we bring to market new financing products that make it very attractive for builders because they can actually save money by putting in heat pumps and the end user also saves money because they have a heat pump. And then to jump topics here slightly before we come back and, and get into some of the economics, what was it like being at X? I feel like often uh, some cloud of uh, secrecy is around it. But more recently, you know, we've seen a lot of companies come out of X, whether it's something like Waymo or, you know, something like Loon that was then spun down, but you've made it through, you're out and, and still going. So would be interested to hear kind of your experience there and what it was like to emerge from, from the parent company. I feel really lucky to have had the job I had there. I mean, just like getting to have such a broad mandate and so much freedom to look at different concepts, essentially learn, you know, the job was essentially like learn about innovation happening in energy and see what opportunities look the most exciting. And I just feel like that was so fun, just such a fun job. And you get to do so with some really talented people there. I think the spin out process, it was one of the first spin outs X had done. So we were kind of making it up as we went along, which honestly, sometimes is the best way, I <laughs> think my preference, because you're not beholden to precedent, you can kind of come up with what you think will work. Though, of course, it has its challenges. So it ended up working out really cleanly in that we just treated X like an incubator, right? Because it, it essentially had been, and they got some equity in Dandelion. We got our f- freedom to sort of pursue this idea outside of X. And everyone agreed that that was the best course because as I said, geothermal heat pumps, the challenge is not invent a breakthrough moonshot new technology that's never existed. The challenge is take something that's actually existed for a long time and just figure out how to productize it and make it affordable and practical. And that's just not a style of problem that X wants to specialize in. So it made a lot of sense as a startup though. So that's that's sort of how that worked. And I will say, I think we continue to benefit, but especially back at the beginning, benefited a lot from getting to start there. I mean, just to give one specific example, when we were at X, we got to try a bunch of different methods for installing that ground heat exchanger. So drilling methods to try to figure out which method would be the best intersection of cost, access to yard, low mass, scalable, you know. I think that type of thing would have been really hard to do from day one without X. Like if if, if somebody was just trying to start this company from scratch, having the budget to just experiment with different ways of drilling It's just hard to raise money to do that because at that point, it's just about learning and trying. It's not even, you don't even know what you don't know, right? And so I think just like having that freedom to just try things and the budget that was willing to support that was a huge advantage for us. Is it kind of like a growing up, you know, they give you your allowance and and then at a certain point they turn around and they say, well, you got to, you got to start getting a real job now. Yes, exactly. We were the baby bird that was just pushed out of the nest when we spun out. And that was definitely a difficult transition for me as a founder, because operating effectively within a large company like X is very different than operating effectively with a startup with no money. And I was like, one day we were one and the next day we were the other. But I think it was for the best. I mean, looking back, you have to learn that as a founder. And I think the earlier you learn, the easier it is. So I am, in retrospect, glad that we were pushed into the deep end in that way. That's right. Trial by fire. Exactly. <laughs> it was. Okay. And then jumping back to the economic side of it, you're right. You mentioned 
it can be more expensive as an upfront cost and some of it can be solved with financing on the financing side are people allowed to include this as part of their home mortgage or is it a new financial product that's added on to it if you're building a new house you can and i think that is one attractive thing about i mean in addition to what you said about you're building everything anyway you have equipment in your yard anyway it's a pretty convenient time to put in geothermal yeah you can put it into your mortgage and that's very low cost financing so it's a great way to do it but of course for a lot of homeowners who are not building their house from scratch i think in theory you could probably try to come up with a financial product that let homeowners cover this type of thing within a mortgage, but it would be very hard. You know, just like the paperwork, I don't think it would be particularly practical. So instead, we've developed, well, I wouldn't say we've developed, we have part we've found partners who have the same exact type of loans that are used for solar projects and we just apply them to geothermal heat pumps. Both solar and heat pumps qualify for federal tax credits. They both tend to have a 20-year lifetime. So the products that have been developed for solar are actually like a really good fit for what we're doing. And we've just been able to use, extend a lot of those loan products to this product. And then for the unit economics for a homeowner, is it largely driven by investment tax credit, by the utility credit? Or are costs coming down such that once, you know, if these incentives disappear, you know, this is still going to be the future, the cheaper, better way of doing it? Yes. So today, the systems after incentives, so after tax credit, after utility subsidy, they tend to be either no money down and about $150 a month, or if you want to pay up front, it's about twenty twenty five thousand dollars after incentives. The cost of getting a furnace plus a new air conditioner installed is probably like fifteen to twenty thousand dollars. So yes, it is incrementally more expensive than that, but the operating cost of using fuel oil or propane is typically around four thousand dollars a year, three to four thousand, whereas using a geothermal heat pump, it's one thousand. So it's a really fast payback. And like, I think to your question about subsidies and what, if it would be economical without them, it would for some homes, right? I think the the thing about home retrofit in general is that how much it costs is a function of the specifics of the home, right? And how much the home benefits is is a function of the specifics of the home. And what the subsidies let us do is it lets this clear and be a great value for most homes. And that's very convenient for us because customer acquisition cost, density of operations, like just being able to build the business and scale it. And that lets you bring the cost down, right? Those incentives are really critical right now just for letting us scale and bringing costs down. But we absolutely are targeting a world where they don't exist, right? We want to be fine and not dependent on them. So what is that next step? What what allows geothermal to scale in the US? Does it work everywhere? Like what's what's the ideal setting? Is it still functional in earthquake zones? Is that, you know, what what are what are kind of some of these barriers to overcome to get to the to the next level of scaling? Well, our number one barrier today is hiring enough drillers to operate the rigs that put in the ground loops. This is by far the biggest hurdle for us. It's not about the drills themselves. We can order those. It's like the skilled labor force. We're hiring as quickly as we can. We we have a training program we have in place. We've started, we acquired actually a drilling company based in Connecticut. So we're really going after that problem on every angle we can think of. And it is starting to work. We have grown our drilling team substantially over the past few months, but the demand for geothermal is growing really quickly. And our challenge is how can we hire drillers fast enough to keep up with that demand? So on the R&D side of our business, we're really engaged in projects that 
we're making progress towards building products that don't require as much ground loop to work as well as they do now with more. So, you know, we've made some progress in shrinking the size of the ground loop you need to get the same amount of heat to the home. And that's really our way of trying to apply technology and science towards this problem of making the limited drilling resources in terms of labor that um, we have access to go as far as they can. Yeah, I'm interested in that. So is the what's the main, I guess, physics or physical constraint there? Is it having enough water at that temperature? What's the angle of attack that you're working on for reducing that loop size? The way you size a ground loop today is you basically ask the question, how much ground loop do you need for a given house? in order for the water temperature circulating throughout that ground loop never to go below 30 degrees Fahrenheit. So even though the ground is 50 degrees, at the very end of winter, when you've like reached your max in terms of heat you've pulled out before you start putting heat back in as you go into spring and summer, you never want the water to get colder than 30 because the heat pumps are designed for 30 degree water. And to solve that problem of what length does it need to be to not go below 30? It also really helps if you know something about the geology in that location, because certain types of geology are better at heat exchange than others. So if you have a very conductive, it's called, formation, you will need a shorter ground loop than if you have a less conductive formation. So before dandelion, a lot of how this was done on the residential side was rule of thumb based. So just like in a given area, a contractor would just have a rule of thumb, like you need 150 feet of ground loop per ton of heating capacity. That was a typical rule of thumb for New York. And the reason that rule of thumb was used is that no one knew what the conductivity was in any given spot. So you might as well assume the worst case so that you don't get it wrong. And so one of the first things we did was we brought a lot more data to this problem and created a map of predicted conductivity underground. And that let us shave the size of those loops down by almost, I think about 35%, 40%. So quite, quite a bit of progress has been made over the past few years just by using data to better understand what geological formation will be hitting and sort of its properties. And then the work we're doing now is we're starting to look at technologies we can use to adjust that 30 degree Fahrenheit limit so that we can actually handle colder water. Because if you go from like, let's say 30 degrees Fahrenheit to 20 degrees Fahrenheit, you can actually cut that loop down by another 35%. And all of a sudden you've literally, you know, more than halved. And then do you need to make up for that with the amount of refrigerant or what, where do you make up for that? decreased temperature? Yeah, you don't make up for it in the amount of refrigerant, but you do have to enable it by the design of the rest of your system. And that's really where we're trying to bring our proprietary technology into play is like, can we design systems that are really targeted towards minimizing the amount of ground loop you need, minimizing also the amount of changes you need to make to the house? So our vision is very much just like plug and play systems where you take out a furnace, you put in a heat pump and you get to do as little as possible outside the house. Still, you do need a ground loop, so you're not doing nothing, but the the smaller we can make that ground loop, the easier it is to scale the business. Has Dandelion Energy considered Bitcoin mining as a heat source and integrating it into the HVAC system? We have not. (laughs) I I can say with confidence we have not. One thing that is very useful is to make a solution that works in pretty much any home, right? Like the more generalized your solution, the better. Because to be able to do roughly the same thing in each home and still have it work well for that home, it brings a lot of simplicity and therefore like cost reduction and scalability to the problem. So um, we're going for simple, scalable, but still effective. Yeah, because we yeah, we've we've definitely done work on the solar battery Bitcoin setup for energy producers. 
but we haven't considered an application in geothermal. But maybe that's maybe that's something I'll do on on the side and and see what it looks like from an economic perspective. Yeah, you certainly do generate heat mining for Bitcoin, but you would need to. I mean, either you need to have like individual mining operations with hardware that was optimally suited for mining Bitcoin. And then I don't know, I like how the economics of that, you'd be paying residential electricity prices for that mining, right? Like, I think just thinking about, right, I think you need to get the you need to get the solar involved too, so you're that you're not so that you're not paying a residential rate. For sure, you would definitely need to. And then I would just say, like, the more things you have to stack, right? Like in in this hypothetical world where you have solar running your Bitcoin mining, that's generating some waste heat that you're incorporating into your heating, then you're looking for homes that don't have too much shading that can have solar that are well suited for heat pump. You know, like in some ways, I think the fewer requirements, the better, right? It's narrowing the market. It is, it is. And like so much of what we're trying to do is push it the other way where it's as generalized as possible. And it's like furnaces are today. You buy, like most furnaces can pretty much work in homes that have ductwork. And if you don't have ductwork, you probably get a boiler and like, it's pretty straightforward, right? And that's what we're up against, making it even more straightforward to do heat pumps. What makes it so that a heat pump couldn't be used? If you're at sea level, does that mean you can't use it? Because then you don't have the it's like if you hit water before you get to the thermal property or... Oh, no, it doesn't matter if you have a high water table. It's actually a good thing for us because water is very conductive. So it means you would need less ground loop if you had a lot of water. But the types of things that make it hard to go from a furnace to a heat pump today are things like... So I'll give you two examples of the, probably the two main things. So one is heat pumps tend to heat air to a lower temperature than a furnace does. and because of this, some ductwork that was designed for homes with furnaces is too small for homes with heat pumps because you don't need as much air if the air is hotter to bring the home to a certain temperature. If you're going to use slightly less hot air, you need more of it. Thus, you need bigger ducts to transport it around. And so just a lot of homes don't have ductwork that's well suited for heat pumps, which is a big problem because it's super expensive and complicated and annoying to redo a home's ductwork. Yeah. Rip it all out. <laughs> yeah. So that's, a, that's an example. Or another example is a lot of homes were not built with that much electricity service. Like the main panel isn't designed to support a fully electrified home. So when you switch a home from using a furnace to a heat pump, sometimes you trigger the need for a main panel upgrade. And these are very expensive, typically like five to $9,000. You have to do it through the utility and that can often have long timelines. And it just will like often kill the homeowner's motivation to get a heat pump because it's this whole other project that they have to do to make it happen. And this is gonna be a challenge for electric vehicles and all sorts of electrification technologies in addition to heat pumps, but it certainly is a challenge for heat pumps as well. So it's like these types of things where the home was itself built for a furnace. Now we're trying to switch it to a heat pump, but we don't wanna change the whole house because that will be too expensive to make it even work. So the, the question we have is, can we design heat pumps that don't require ductwork changes, don't require main panel upgrades? You know, like, can we just design heat pumps that sub in for furnaces as in as streamlined a way as possible so that um, all the homeowner needs to do is switch one thing, not switch their whole home? That makes a lot of sense. Is there anything that I didn't ask that I should ask that our listeners should know about geothermal energy, how should our listeners, if they're interested in geothermal, one, what should they do? And how do they follow along with advances in, in the industry? How do they stay, stay up with what's going on in geothermal technology? Well, I will surprise no one by suggesting that they visit our website, <laughs> dandelionenergy.com. And we serve today New York, Massachusetts, some of Vermont, Connecticut, and soon 
part of New Jersey. So very much the Northeast, some of the Northeast states. I think that like a good, yeah, a good source of information on heat pumps and geothermal. I mean, Vox did a really good piece on heat pumps and geothermal overall that I would definitely recommend. And I think also one question you had asked that I didn't answer is, you know, where does this make sense in the U.S.? I would say for people who live in places that get really cold in the winter, geothermal is a great option to look into. And for people that live in places that are pretty mild year round, I would recommend they look into air source heat pumps in weather regimes where the ground and the air don't differ that much in temperature. Air source heat pumps tend to work really well and they basically, um, do the equivalent thing of letting you decarbonize the way you're heating and cooling and shift off of fossil. And from your company's perspective, what goes into providing service in a new state? Is that like a complicated regulatory barrier to jump over or is it is it something else? Well, first of all, there's a cost to us of going into new states because we're vertically integrated. So because we've made the decision to own the entire customer experience with the drillers and the installers and everything, we really have to allocate capital to open a new warehouse in a new place. And so we tend to be very deliberate about not trying to expand too quickly. That said, we really prioritize states where the utilities have great incentives for homeowners because it just makes the value proposition such a no-brainer for homeowners So I would say, yeah, the utility incentive, states with a lot of uh, homes using fuel oil or propane and states that have, you know, cold winters and warm summers. I think those three things are really the three things that we look for when we go into a new place. Awesome. Well, Kathy, thank you so much for joining us today and for teaching me so much about dandelion energy and geothermal heating and cooling. Thank you so much for having me and for being interested. ARC believes that the information presented is accurate and was obtained from sources that ARC believes to be reliable. However, ARC does not guarantee the accuracy or completeness of any information, and such information may be subject to change without notice from ARC. Historical results are not indications of future results. Certain of the statements contained in this podcast may be statements of future expectations and other forward-looking statements that are based on ARC's current views and assumptions and involve known and unknown risks and uncertainties that could cause actual results, performance, or events to differ materially from those expressed or implied in such statements.